Welcome back to another episode of Out of the Blank Podcast. I'm here with two special guests, frequent flyers on the Out of the Blank Podcast airwaves. All right, that was a little bit corny, but guys, it's a pleasure to be able to speak with you again. Uh, I wanted to have you guys both back on to talk about some things we might have dived into in previous episodes, but we never fully talked about in an extensive or maybe fully elaborate when it comes to deep political research. What does that mean to each of you? And how does it affect in the past? Or how do you notice it in the past? And how does it affect today's times? And how would you see it in today's times? Joe, we'll start off with you. Okay. Well, um, deep political research is, in some ways, it's kind of a misnomer. But the, the basic idea is that you are studying things that are generally not part of the establishment narrative. So the stories that aren't covered because for whatever reason they were covert, um, either because they were involved in war, like, you know, so like the big ones, World War One, World War II, Korea, and so on, um, or because they were part of what they call black operations, which is to say things that the government is doing that is not generally publicized, uh, typically in other countries, but then as it turns out, uh, also in our own country. So that's what we're that's what we're really talking about when you're talking about deep politics or sometimes parapolitics, which is a term that Ken Thomas uses, although parapolitics is maybe slightly broader than deep politics. It's intended to be uh, sort of like uh, the difference between normal and paranormal, you know, things that are that are outside of of uh, ordinary structures that we're used to talking about. I think that's a short version. Rich. It's a good short version. Um, <clears throat> You know, this goes back to a book that came out during the Kennedy administration uh, called The Invisible Government. Uh, there were a lot of terms used for this. Uh, invisible government, para, para uh, government. Uh, you know, even as late as 75, when Robert Redford was making Three Days of the Condor, it wasn't, you know, the term deep politics wasn't known yet. It was beginning to formulate in um, Peter Dale Scott's mind, Professor Peter Dale Scott, he's the guy that came up with the term deep politics. But that's before he saw the connection to um, the term the deep state. That came much later. Um, but, you know, we all learned the, deep, the term deep politics from uh, Peter Dale Scott. Uh, by the time he wrote his book, Deep Politics and the Assassination of JFK. Um, but, um, you know, it really goes back, you know, we've talked about how it goes back to Machiavelli, but let's bring it up to date. Modern times goes back to Eisenhower. Eisenhower's farewell speech. Uh, everybody knows the term military industrial complex. That's what we're talking about here. He he edited that back. He was told he was told you're going too far when you say military industrial congressional complex. Um, but he did add a second term in that speech that nobody seems to remember, and that's the scientific technological elite. They're equals. He said, beware of misplaced power. He didn't say beware of the military industrial complex. Because he helped build the military industrial complex during his administration more than anybody else. And he knew the military side better than anybody else. And he had learned the industrial side, obviously. Um, but he added the scientific, uh, scientific technological elite. Because we know what else was going on during those years. He had scientific experts. We won't get into MJ-12, but those are the levels of experts that he had in his administration. He knew the danger of misplaced power. That's the warning. The warning is misplaced power that is not checked by statesmanship, by uh, politicians who can stand up to it. Now, guess who took those words to heart? Not right away, but eventually in his administration, Kennedy did. Jack Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy were following, were taking Eisenhower's warning seriously. Uh, and so we know how that turned out. Truman did too. Um, a lot of people don't realize that either, but Truman made a statement about either on Dag Hammarskjöld's death when he asked the media about it. He said, notice how he was on the verge of getting something done when they killed him. 
Notice how I said they killed him. He also made an article, and I don't know if it's the Washington Post, but he wrote an article basically saying that the CIA is way off basis to what their original mission was and that they need to be reined in because their powers have just gotten out of control. And then Alan Dulles made a fake document or made a wanted a retraction of Truman's document saying that Truman didn't mean what he said, but later just put in the files that it was faked or someone took Truman's words out of context when really that is what Truman said. And Truman changed his opinion on JFK later in life as well, too. Um, there's videos of him and JFK walking together when originally he thought that it was a joke to have someone, someone as young as Kennedy being uh, leader of the country. So it's interesting that, that there's been many political people that have kind of hinted at the deep state. Um, Joe, do you want to go first with Truman? <laughs> yeah, no, Truman. No, no, Truman's no, 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 at you on Truman. Uh, Truman's editorial is well worth uh, finding. It was, I want to, it may have been the post, but I want to say it was in the New York times. And, um, I actually, I found that about that very late. I found that about that from Jim D'Eugenio's book, Reclaiming Parkland, which is, I don't know, 10 or 12 years ago. And, um, you're, you're absolutely right. There's no, it, it's really interesting because Truman doesn't say it, but he, what he says is that the CIA has exceeded its defined boundaries. So Truman is saying basically as much as he can say publicly without saying, hey, you know, the CIA is out there killing everybody. But you should you guys should watch this. And by the way, I'm putting this on the record and saying that I'm warning you about it. And I think that's part of the thing. That's also part of what Eisenhower was doing is some of these guys are aware of these these uh, operations. And I feel like they're putting a little bit of distance between them in a historical sense. It's the same reason that Hoover made sure to get it on the record that he did not believe that the that Oswald's voice is shown on the tapes or that Oswald's uh, that what he looks like is he's clearly not in Mexico. And I think that some of these guys are doing that because they know that at some point in the historical record, it's going to be revealed that all this, you know, what uh, Lyndon Johnson called a damned murder incorporated in the Caribbean. Uh, is going to eventually be revealed, and they want to put some distance between themselves and those operations. So, but still, all of that was later. Robbie's words later in life. That's the key to Truman. After the assassination, then he writes the editorial. Um, he's he's t way too late to the game. Uh, he was put in power. He was vice president only because of the Pauli coup which Oliver Stone talks about in The Hidden History of the United States, um, The Untold History of the United States. With Peter Kuzma, um, past guest. Truman, Truman knew that he got power through ousting Henry Wallace. He, he spent his entire administration <laughs> continuing the military-industrial complex. He, you know... Uh, well, b building it, I guess he was he was before he was before Eisenhower, of course. But uh, he, you know, built the the structure. He put in the the National Security Act of nineteen forty seven forty eight, and uh, you know, and then later he says, "Oh well, it's gone way beyond what I had envisioned, what I had intended." Yeah, give me a break. I don't give him any slack on that at all. Uh, it, at the very minimum, what that says is they were keeping all of that secret from the president of the United States. So there's the deep state at work during Truman. You, all right. So I'll buy the argument. So Truman was too dumb to see it. I'll take I'll take that. I don't buy it, though. Uh, I think Truman was was smart. I used to like Truman. I used to love his intelligence uh, and his wit. Um so he was a smart guy. He he came up through politics from the ground up. He was an election worker. I became an election worker because Truman started out as an election worker. And I learned a hell of a lot about how elections happen. It, ha it starts at, you know, the term all politics is local. You bet it is. And you want to see politics? You go work at your local polling place and you see how those votes are counted. And I used to count votes by hand. These These guys, we got some local guys here some Republicans in the next county over who decided, oh, we're going to count all the ballots by hand. 
in the primary this year. It's coming up March 2nd. Uh, <laughs> they have no idea what they're getting into. There are laws in place telling you exactly how to count those ballots. And you do one count, you get a number. You're required to do it three times. You do a second count, you get a different number. You got, you got dozens of people counting these ballots. They all get a different number each time you count it. You have to keep counting until you get two numbers the same. They think they're going to count those hand-counted hand ballots in four hours. They've given themselves four hours to get all the ballots counted. They're going to go all night. They have no clue what they're getting into. They're just buying into this MAGA, oh, America was much better when, he, when we hand-counted ballots. Forget it. Um, but Truman, that's how he started. I used to like him. He's smart. He knew what was going on. He dropped both bombs on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. He didn't have to. He knew he didn't have to. He bought into the Cold War. He bought into dominating the Soviets. He got us into uh, Korea, <laughs> which is still going on, by the way. And so I don't cut Truman any slack anymore. I don't even cut FDR any slack. These guys were great. Here's the key to this whole thing with presidents, U.S. presidents. They're great. The Democrats are great on domestic policy, not on foreign policy. They don't have the power. Truman's a good example of that. He didn't have the power to even know about what was going on in foreign policy. Um, they don't have control of foreign policy. So that just goes wild. But they have control of domestic po policy. That's how they maintain the illusion that the president is the president, because he does all this great stuff domestically. Um, I'm not disagreeing Kennedy with saw, you, but I think you got to examine this from, I think it's about people care more about where they're from, like that home field advantage I mentioned to you guys last time, the team efforts. I mean, if you can do, how many operations were going on overseas at anybody, ethically, if that was going on here, it's either seen as not believable or people are just horrified at that something that could happen. And that's when you see people take a stand because we never cared about what happened overseas in other countries because it didn't affect us. And I think you have a shift in the mindset of certain figures. I think when Truman realized after the Kennedy assassination that these things could happen domestically and to people in positions of power, I think you start looking at where the, the statements start coming out. It doesn't make it right. It doesn't justify but I also think it's just the mindset back then. A lot more people, like if we didn't weren't so experienced with overseas actions and didn't have that empathy factor, you know, we probably would be thinking along the same lines. We are only going to care about our families and the people that are we're supposed to be in charge to protect. And now your method of protecting might be confused. You know what I mean? Like their method of protecting might actually be doing some more damage. Um, but it's about having that empathy factor that out branches past the united states you know it's not just the united states here it's every other country that we're involved in every other country that we're doing horrible things whether it's regime change i don't care what you want to call the person there's just unethical actions and discourses let's talk about unit 731 for example what do we do with that we just let all those people get away for all the crimes against humanity only because it fit our best interests when it comes to research japan doesn't even talk about it they made an agreement with us that we couldn't talk about it that's unethical but we don't want to mess up relations with Japan. That doesn't make any sense to me, but we still do it. You see what I'm saying here? Well, yeah, that's a that's a big topic. And I'm trying to remember his name, the um, the Joseph Mengele of Japan. Oh, General uh, Hiroishi? Yeah, yeah, Ishii, yeah. Where we made these deals with other countries, but other countries were pursuing the same kind of experiments chemical warfare all this stuff that's going on and you're right it's not obviously it's not just the west um any country that gets powerful enough to mess with these things is eventually going to go there and that is what happened one of the interesting things that i've been finding lately i've been doing a lot of work on on uh, uh some of the paperclip stuff and what's interesting if you go through the documentation you realize that these things are not monolithic these things are all sort of intertwined and different they have different positions uh, at different times and because there are so many individual people involved you get reports that say all kinds of different stuff so i've been looking at this stuff around 47 48 um the paperclip was largely an army counterintelligence corps operation uh, although the cia was involved obviously and alan dulles was a key figure um but the cic was doing the sort of nitty-gritty work 
from day to day of getting these guys to come in. And at that time, the reports that are saying don't do this are coming from the CIA. So I have reports from the CIA where they're saying, hey, maybe not this Klaus Barbie guy. This guy's a pretty big Nazi. Are you are you sure about this? And of course, CIC overrules them. And you also have to understand that because the CIA had just been newly created, that it did not have as much power and as much voice right then as it would quickly acquire. So it's, it's, it, the point being not that the CIA is good, but just that when you're looking at all of these different things, um, you you will find surprising items in the historical record because not everybody agrees with everything all at once. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you mentioned, well, Rich mentioned Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Did you know Unit 731 killed more? The Japanese killed more Chinese with entomological warfare than Hiroshima and Nagasaki combined. And that doesn't even get mentioned in the history books. It's not taught there all because we made a deal. So it really comes into does foreign policy affect the optics of how we want to view ourselves as ethical human beings in our establishments? I mean, it's a tough question, but it made me rethink a lot wanna, of things. You might want to add in the people who are still dying today from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Yeah, that there's you can bring up the generational thing too, but the that total number of people that died in the first few months of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and even the ones after, like you mentioned, do not still add up to the numbers of Japanese killing Chinese. Yeah, I, I you know, I agree with that, but, but that doesn't make any of it any better. No, it doesn't. Uh, there was no reason to drop those bombs. Optics, like I just mentioned, the optics. Does foreign policy affect optics? Um, so. Yeah. Uh, well, and, and, you know, I mentioned FDR. FDR did great things domestically with domestic policy. Um, but he knew he knew Pearl, he, he let Pearl Harbor happen. I mean, you can't get around that. World War Two, our entry into World War Two. You know, you have to remember that people, United States citizens are always anti-war. They don't want to get into another war. You can look at before World War One, huge anti a huge peace um, movement before World War II. Huge peace movement. They had to do things like uh, the Maine for the Spanish American War. They had to do things like Pearl Harbor to get us into the war. Uh, all the way up to 9/11 to get us into Afghanistan. You know, they had to really start that operation of surrounding China, taking control of those countries around China. Uh, you say that, but I would bring an aside up to that. Didn't we? Get at, weren't the, all these people talking trash on the Ukraine, and now they're saying that we need to go over there and assist the Ukraine against going against Russia? Isn't that walking into another war? Yes, that's absolutely that's a proxy war. That proxy war has been going on since 2014. Um, and if you want to get serious about it, it does go back to World War II because there were Nazis all over Ukraine back then, and they're still there. These, these are, I mean, I don't want to give you any strikes, but. <laughs> it's it's an absolute re re reality that the United States is fighting a proxy war with Russia through Ukraine the same way we did in Afghanistan in the 80s and helped out Osama and his and his kiddos uh, to fight the Soviets and gave them a 10-year war, gave them their Vietnam, uh, in the words of Zbigniew Brzezinski. So th there's no question this stuff continues, absolutely. And you go back to Paperclip, you look at uh, Gladio, Operation Gladio. You look at what we're doing during and after World War II in the Eastern European countries, bordering Russia. Uh, you know the fake Oswald, the guy that came over from Russia, the guy that replaced the birth Oswald with, from the Ukraine. You know, and so a good starting point, yeah, 2014, but you can go back, uh, you know, 50 years before that. Well, my kind of point was you, you mentioned the American public doesn't want a war. I go, I don't think the American public doesn't – they don't know what they want. The government can sway it and manipulate it in any sense, and next thing you know, we'll be wanting to invade Afghanistan again and go get troops back and be involved after we just pulled out of there. You know, We don't want, know what we want because we can easily – general public can be easily manipulated. Like look at the um, Paul Landis story. People are calling the single bullet theory SBT. Don't do that. Call it the single bullet theory. That's why it's there. Theory. When you say SBT, it completely makes it sound more logical 
you give it a nickname because it's easier. No, you're destroying the fact that there's that ending part theory. It's non-existent. It's a it's a it's an idea of what could have happened, but it's never been verifiably proven. Despite all the other claims about whatever, it's called a theory for a reason. Well, the single bullet theory. I, I don't think we need Paul Landis to kill it. I think it was it was dead at birth. Uh, Arlen Specter is not a ballistics expert. And so therefore his opinion on what may have happened with one bullet or another is essentially irrelevant. I stopped calling it a theory. It's not a theory, not in a scientific sense. It's a fantasy. Um, you know, uh, Joe, uh, have you heard uh, Eugenio, Jim Eugenio talking to that podcast guy yet about Stephen King? No, not yet. We were just talking about that before. We I uh, listened to it. Yeah, the whole thing. Fantastic. Fantastic. It's a lot of, for guys like us, there's a lot of one-on-one stuff uh, in there, but not that much, you know. Um, so uh, he goes back over all of this, and he destroys Stephen King. Stephen King kind of got Good. all cocky. Good. Stephen I King called Stephen cocky. King out on Twitter, but I never, obviously not going to hear anything back about that lie he made about Mar Margaret Oswald asking Lee to pull his pants down and show him as a, how as a man to see if he's developing. I was like, where's your evidence for that? For someone that calls out so much bullshit as Stephen King does on Twitter, and he has the balls to put that in there, I get it. He's a fiction writer, novelist, whatever you want to say, but if you're going to put something like that that gets mandala affected into our history where people are acting like, oh yeah, Margaret Oswald used to do this to her son or whatever. That's why he turned out this way. I'm like, well, that's not real at all. Yeah, Mandela effect and also uh, twisting words. Sing we we automatically, our brain, my brain still does this. It goes, if I say single bullet, I want to say theory. But I stopped doing that because it's not a theory in any sense. It's a spec. Oh, this is what Eugenio said. He said that uh, Spectre, when he was coming up with this uh, single bullet theory, uh, he, uh, somebody asked the Secret Service, uh, why didn't you guys come up with this? And they said it, it, there was no way. There's no, the Spectre himself said that the Secret Service didn't come up. He was, it was Spectre who was asked this. Why didn't the Secret Service come up with this before you did? He said that they hadn't realized yet that without the single bullet theory, you have to find a second assassin. So there's good stuff, you know, even though he goes back over the secretaries on the stairwell for like 10 minutes, there's good stuff if you go through the whole thing. And it, the whole thing, I was very pleased with it. I'm going to listen to it again. The Eugenio on a podcast where they, he's talking to an expert about Stephen King, where they talk about nothing but Stephen King. But the host was, he had already seen JFK revisited. So he knew enough about Kennedy already to know that you know, King you know, as great as King was, as great as they think King is, that he was off here somehow, but he couldn't articulate it. That's why he invited Jim on him. Man, he couldn't have done a better job than invite Jim to destroy. He destroyed Stephen King. Totally. In fact, he offered to debate Stephen King. And he talked about how Posner still chickens out of debating him. So, but single bullet theory, you know, you know Spectre knew exactly what he was doing. If you don't have the single bullet theory, you got to look for a second assassin. And nobody wanted to look for a second assassin. That's how we got the single bullet fantasy. So I guess my message here is about the whole sales pitch. You know, I, I when I go back to American people or whoever, the people don't know what they want. It just it's sales pitched. That's all it is. Whether it's media does it, whether it's the government does it, whether it's this. And it's we can bring it to the example of the Warren Report, a more condensed version, 600 something pages, whatever it is that is given to the public as a basic summary. And then you compare it to the volumes, you know, all that reading, all that people just want the bits like the YouTube clips. They just want the short bits of information and what the overall say. So anybody out there can be an expert. You can buff up 60 seconds. You can do whatever you want for an hour conversation. Uh, but it's a 
about those tactics at, where it makes you question, do people want the truth? Would you be willing to accept the truth that something is more horrible around you? Or would you rather just live in kind of the narrative that has been given to you? It's something I come in contact with every single day when I speak to academics about certain conversations. Half of them don't know what Operation Northwoods is. Half of them don't know what Operation Mongoose is. They don't know any other covert actions, MK Ultra being a good example. And it's not a willingness to want to know, but it's been pitched as that I never told you that the government never said anything about it to you on live television. So we're not going to consider it real unless we see a host in a full tuxedo and a bow tie come on and tell me, or Geraldo Rivera, let's give that guy a shout out. He comes on with a giant mustache and tells people, Hey, this is what happened. That's not going to happen though. You're going through that. You're like uh, almost two years into this now, Robbie. What? Uh, Death? And- uh, no, the JFK assassination, so and so and, and deep politics, and you're going, you've got, gone through that that first phase where you're going, I can understand this, I can see what's happening here. Why can't anybody else? You're bumping up against everybody else you know in your daily life, and they don't know any of this, they don't get any of this, and you try to explain it to them, they still don't get it. Imagine doing that for twenty five, thirty years. From that. Imagine if every day is like that for the next 30 years. You're in the Groundhog Day of the JFK assassination. Where would your mindset be at that point? That's where I am. I've been I've been writing about this. We're not we're not going to resolve this by waiting for the citizens to get on board. And there are a lot of researchers who are totally still focused on just that. I'd say most researchers are still focused on convincing the mass public to know what we know, it's not gonna happen. It's gonna take the few of us who know, I made the comparison in my essay, A Few Bad Men, that you know, when they, when they come up with an equation for quantum gravity, connecting, uh, connecting gravity to the uh, special relativity, uh, which has not been done yet, you would think it, it would be simple, but it's not. Gravity is something totally different than anybody understands. It's going to take a handful of guys who know the subject backwards, forwards, you know, inside and out to come up with that equation. If it's possible to come up with, they might come up with something else saying, we got to throw all this physics out and do this instead. And it's kind of heading in that direction. But it's only a handful, let's say it's a dozen guys and gals who are knowledgeable enough to even attempt to do this. The mass public, I, I use the analogy, it's like expecting the mass public to come up with it. No, it's going to take the few of us who know this subject getting our heads together every day to work this out. I think we could work it out quickly if we did. But you know, try going on and on and debating the idea of debating Posner, oh, what a waste of time. You know, trying to convince your your family and your friends at Thanksgiving, what you know, waste of time. We got to resolve what what we have to do is resolve the Kennedy assassination. The government can no longer hide behind lone nut. Then the government is responsible. Then they are responsible. They've always been responsible. We, it's not been our job to do all this. We've done it because we can't, they just lie, big lie, the big lie. Uh, So we just do this, but we're in this, we're in this loop. We just keep doing it. You don't need to examine every rock on a mountain to know it's a mountain. So the government is forced to admit that it's a mountain. Then they have to act. They can't admit that, yeah, the government killed Kennedy. And they can't, they can't just sit there and say, oh, well, move on. Now for the sports. They can't do that. Once, you know, so our, our job is to force that uh, acceptance. Uh, and we can do it legally. We can do it just by you know, pushing against the right people. So that's where my mindset is after 30 years of trying to convince family and friends and knowing they're not going to get it. The citizens don't, they don't keep up with this stuff. They're too busy. And that's part of the, part of the game. Uh, we're made to be too busy in our daily lives to think about stuff deeply. That's all part of it. Yeah, but usually people would have a general curiosity about something. If you talked about a false flag operation, I feel like as an academic, the ones I've spoken to about it, 
they would just have an interest of looking that up and seeing that there is this thing called a false flag operation. And maybe I should do a little bit more research on it and see where events like this have transpired. But there's not none of that. I talk to a lot of academics. It's not like I'm just a conspiracy JFK show. I talk to any topic, really. And it's interesting to me that I have to explain to people that Gerald Ford edited a report to move a back wound up six inches to match the single bullet theory. And people go, that's not real. And then I have to send them those clips. And they go, holy crap, wait a minute, is it something? I'm like, yeah, 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 but why don't you just search and go farther into it? But they don't know what to do about it. See, you, Robbie, you're doing something about it. You're taking your knowledge and you're putting it to action. And you have a big audience. You have a big, curious audience, and they get it. Uh, I'd say, you know, 75, conservatively, 75% of your audience totally gets it. But there's another level beyond that. Once you get it, the question is, if you even ask yourself the question, I wonder if people even ask themselves the question, now what? What am I going to do about it? What do we do about it? Most people come to the conclusion, and the game is geared towards this too. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we can't know. We'll never know. Uh, so... Uh, yeah, and there's there's two, there's really two tracks here that we're talking about, because you've got you're talking about two different um, social groups. You're talking about people in general and then academics, and there are different things going on in each of those pools. Um, you know, for, for when you're talking about the general public, you have to understand that, as, as Richard mentioned, serious study is just not, it's not encouraged. And for most people, it's simply not possible. Uh, because they have too many other things to worry about other than doing that. So, uh, you know, there's, there's uh, this has been remarked in other contexts, but if you want to know something, a specific fact about the Bible, you're not going to ask a Christian. You're going to ask an atheist because the atheist has actually read the book, right? That's the thing, you know, and that's that's exactly the same thing because in general, most people are not interested in you know, this sort of thing. They just want their lives to be relatively simple. They want to be able to say, okay, this is the structure that I'm living in. I'm going to make do as best I can. They don't really want to go into the details and figure out exactly what's happening. And so there's an opposite process when you're talking about academics. Because of academic specialization, generally speaking, and I grew up around academics, they know a lot about one thing. But in other areas, they read Time Magazine just like everybody else. So I've, I've, I have found this over and over again, that somebody will know everything there is to know about a specific aspect of anthropology or of history or of English literature. Uh, but in other areas, they, don't, they, they know barely more than anybody else. But why? It's just the way it is. Why steer away from something that is, to me, not even a heavy topic? Like, it's a horrible tragedy that happened, but also if you're understanding that there might be something that you have as information that could possibly be wrong, wouldn't you want to go on the endeavor to try and find out what the truth is, even despite if those truths don't fit with your beliefs? I've noticed this with friends where they're like, man, I just, it's a heavy topic. I don't really want to talk about that politically or that politically. I'm like, I'm not even talking about modern day politics. I'm talking about something serious where people were getting drugged in a brothel and they hate Ashbury clinics with drugs. And it's like, that's nuts. And it's fascinating, but people don't find it fascinating. They find it dreadful and it makes them seem more pessimistic about the world. And I'm like, well, you're living in a bubble. I don't see how that's fun. Well, and it's all breaking down. I mean, the reason why uh, people are believing more of this now, who are they're more prone to conspiracies. In fact, they're more prone to ridiculous conspiracies now. Uh, what what Richard terms conspiracy fantasy rather than conspiracy theory um, is precisely because they do not have the buy in that earlier generations had. So you got to understand, after World War II, there was a tremendous explosion of prosperity in the United States. There was a middle class that was created. This was the American dream. So suddenly people had good jobs. They were making good money. They had families. Things were good. And as Western civilization has started to collapse in the wake of the Kennedy assassination, I would argue, I recently argued in an essay, um, people have less buy-in, especially young people who look at their lives and say, I can either commit to a university and pay off this debt over the rest of my life, 
or I can not do that and work in retail for the rest of my life. Like there, there are no good options anymore. And therefore, because it's all collapsing, it's easier to believe then that it's been massively corrupt since the beginning. And, you know, there's truth to that, but there's also subtleties that are, that are missed either way. But yeah, the, the, the whole reason I think that more of us have a bigger footprint than we used to is precisely because the whole thing is coming down. Brilliant analysis there, Mr. Green. Um, I could just sit here and listen to you talk the whole broadcast. Um, you have the advantage of having grown up inside academia and seeing that up close. I have the advantage, if you want to call it that, of growing up inside uh, the military industrial complex. My dad was just a worker at Collins Radio, which was a, not only a military contractor, they were a CIA contractor. Nobody knew anything about this at the time. Uh, Kenneth Porter, the guy that Marina eventually married after the assassination, he was he worked there. But they didn't work in the same department, maybe even the same building, but they knew of each other. You know, you know, you know your coworkers around a big establishment like that. Uh, and when he married Marina Oswald. That was the topic around Collins Radio, and and people were like astounded. You know, like, oh, why? Why is this happening? He was happily married. Uh, you know, there was no sign that any of this was going to happen, and then all of a sudden, he, this Collins Radio guy, marries Marina Oswald in '64 uh, or '65, early '65, something like that, but very quickly, and the whole thing happened very quickly. Um, so, uh, I got some insight, some early insight to that. It took years and years for me to put all that together. The subtleties, you talk about the subtleties. I'm probably in my research, I'm probably very into finding and resolving those subtleties at this point. I noticed that most of the research, even today, is about finding new facts, building the fact base, finding and examining more rocks on the mountain. My idea is, uh, you know, the subtlety of not only the mountain, but the mountain range. And how do you show people, how do you get a good look at a mountain when you're on the mountain? Uh, and so that's subtlety. And, you, and most people are not going to get there, not in any kind of, you know, practical timeline that, that we have, have to. The you answer know, the to your little riddle about how do you take a picture of the mountain when you're on the mountain is you just give your phone to someone to take the picture for you. But how many people are going to be willing to give their information to someone else that might piece together something? Look at the research community. Look how closed off it's been for a lot of people. Individual groups, individual theories, everyone fights if you, even if you agree with the side of conspiracy. In my opinion, you start with a lie. What's the lie? Well, if you have something like Gerald Ford moving a wound up six inches that hasn't really been explained of why he did that besides trying to make it more accurate, that is a lie. That is something that is very confusing. It doesn't make sense. It wasn't elaborated on. Take the same thing with the John Lennon assassination. If you found two types of ammunition in the coroner's report on the morgue document on John Lennon's body and a doctor has lied for 30 years saying he was pumping John Lennon's heart and that has been written about by Washington Post, all these other articles, then you start with the lie. And you say, if this is something that happened, maybe I can take you a little bit deeper. It's just the issue is, is how deep do you go before you lose track of where the public still stands? And sadly, a lot of people aren't interested in these subjects. To me, they're fascinating. I mean, I don't profit off of any of these conspiracy subjects, but I don't like calling them really conspiracy because it's so damn frustrating when you're looking at a government document stating that, oh, yes, we tried to poison Castro's swimming suit. And people just go, that sounds crazy. I'm like, it does sound crazy, but it's real. And our government tried it. There's a book about what you're talking about, Robbie. It's by Jim Diogenio. It's called The Chokeholds of the JFK Assassination. I interviewed Paul Blue about it. Yeah. So uh, he just goes through the, the obvious lies and nails them. So anybody that wants to like a, a, a shortcut... <laughs> And blow their mind on you know the extent of the lies. Eugenio put it all in one volume, and uh, but then people that are new to this they they 
it boggles my mind that there are people who are new to this, but I have to get used to people like you who weren't even alive, you know, for 25 years I caught years up ago. pretty even quick in was, two years. Come on. Totally. And you, you give me so much hope <laughs> because of what you did, because I, I was pretty much done uh, learning all this by the time you were born. And I was writing it 25 years ago, 30 years ago. Uh, and then all that sat around for 30 years, and, and then it all culminates into this. It was 10 years before I was even aware that anybody else was reading my stuff. started getting emails from, like, Australia <laughs> saying, hey, I read your paper. Uh, it, it takes a long time for it to filter out you know, into the people who want to know. A lot of people don't want to know. A lot of people, you'll tell them directly something like that, one of the chokeholds, and they'll say, oh, no, I don't want to hear that. You know. My mom was, my mom was like, my mother-in-law was that way. My wife's family was that way, except for Irwin. Um, so <clears throat> there's a whole psychology here that I'm very interested in as well. Uh, but I think it's taught me that uh, we first resolve it. Once we resolve it, once the government says it's official, then everybody will accept it. Uh, that's the way the, the citizens do it. Uh, they accept whatever the anchors on the news are telling them. Well, you get the government to accept conspiracy, the anchors have to report that. When they report it, the citizens have to accept it. It's like the UAP thing. Uh, you don't have a lot of people laughing at you anymore if you uh, are a witness to a UFO. Uh, and it's because on the news, they now do it straight face. They don't snicker every time they report a UFO sighting. It'll be the same way with the Kennedy assassination. We just have to force that acceptance. Yeah, and there's still, I mean, there's still a lot of pushback over even certain things. There was, um, I forget, I should never get, in, I, I rarely get involved in these discussions on Twitter, but somebody, I think, asked me a direct question. And, um, and I said, well, the last governmental investigation concluded that there was a conspiracy in the Kennedy assassination. So, you know, why when when we say that um, Oswald did it alone, we are actually reverting back to the Warren Commission and ignoring the House Select Committee on Assassinations. Why would we do that? Now, I don't accept the reason that the HSCA said there was a conspiracy because I don't really accept the dicta belt stuff. But fact remains, they wrote it. You can see it in their book. And they said this is a probable conspiracy. So why does it still remain uh, the intellectual equipment, uh, equivalent of leprosy uh, whenever you're in a conversation about this stuff? Uh, and it has to, it, it, it obviously has nothing to do with the facts. It doesn't have anything to do with the evidence. It has to do with what we're talking about here, all of these social and psychological factors and the fact that most people, generally speaking, uh, do not have the anti-establishment gene. You know, they just don't want to make their lives more difficult, and I don't blame them. I blame the political parties. I blame the left. I blame the right. I blame all of them. Uh, I didn't notice this until I started posting clips up about it. Uh, when I posted a clip up about Unit 731, and I would bring the example of Unit 731 because a lot of people don't know about it. A lot of people say, well, you're being kind of racist, Asian, anti-Asian hate. I'm like, that's not what that is. But then I noticed it in some of the comments on some of those clips that trended about Unit 731, one that got like 4,000 views. People were commenting, screw those Japanese. And I commented and I said, are you fucking kidding me? Because you really have to examine this. That's not the when we talk about an Israel conflict or whatever is going on right now, you're not talking about the the people. You're talking about the government, the establishments, the people who are running and making the decisions to launch missiles and blow up buildings. That's what you talk about. So I understand the left's point of like anti-Asian hate when it comes to Unit 731. I understand that. But that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about a government that allowed to test on its own people, prisoners, pregnant women. And all this other type of stuff. Same thing that happens over here. We test on experimental prisoners all the time still. And that's recorded. And that's on the government's website that they still do that. And we don't talk about it. Why? Because are they just devalued as human beings? That doesn't make sense to me. But we don't blame the institutions. We blame the whole specific group. If you talk about the government, what government? Are they right or are they left? That's not what this is about. This is about people in positions of power that I don't think identify under those flags that they say that they're flying. Does that make sense? Like, I'm not trying to be super conspiracy, but I mean, it boils around the deep state conversation a little bit. It makes perfect sense because the we're encouraged to talk about uh, racial and sexual identity. 
Uh, but the real identity that you need to worry about is the state. Who is identified with the state and who is not, and who is important to the state and who is not. So those, and as generally speaking, do not have anything to do with color, creed, or whatever. I mean, it can because there are racist principles that are imbued into governments. But basically, that's what you're dealing with. You're talking about governments. You're exactly right. You're never talking about, uh, you know, somebody's race or you know that these people are inherently bad. I mean, these are stupid ideas. However governments are inherently violent by their very nature. And this is true all over the world. This is not simply true in this little slice of time that we talk about. Uh, it's just a function of being a government. Yeah. Well, this is nothing about this is new, this whole psychology of uh, going back and forth on all this stuff. As you were talking, I was thinking about Stop, please, to the love of God, that's a YouTube flag. Yeah, I'm not, I'm just going to say that. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to say the whole Nikki Haley thing where she, she fails to say the word slavery. You know, the fact that that's still going on now when, you know, that was, that was the whole deep state thing of the, uh, um, you know, the early, you know, the, the whole 600 years of slavery up to, uh, you know, 1860. Um, you know, there were there were abolitionists, there were slaveholders, uh, and and there still are. There's still people with a slaveholder mentality, uh, but and, and there are still slaves. I mean, if you uh, if you are in prison, you are a slave. You're allowed to be a slave. The Constitution says that slavery is abolished except for prisoners. It actually says that in the Constitution. Uh, so, but that was the deep state debate uh, prior to the Civil War uh, and during the Civil War. And we still do that today with different topics. Uh, you could go on and on with the trigger words for YouTube on that. Um, and that's why they're trigger words. As a matter of fact, that is why they're trigger words, uh, because of that psychology. It's taboo. And we're not allowed to talk about it. And they enforce. They're now enforcing taboos. It used to be just a socially accepted thing. Uh, racism, the whole civil rights movement. You know, uh, my mom grew up in a racist family. My my uh, mom's side of the family owned slaves at some point in East Texas. You find any any uh, black family named Stubblefield. Uh, they were probably uh, slaves of my mother's side of the family at one point. Um, so, and I saw how that racism went generation to generation and survived into my mom's generation, my uncle's. Uh, so, uh, man, it goes on today. The taboo is real. It used to be a socially accepted thing. Uh, but now it has to be enforced because, because of wokeness. <laughs> you have to crack down. And once you start cracking down on the taboos, you're looking at, uh, I mean, and this this subject saying anything is like uh, Weimar Germany. I'll just put it that way. Saying anything is like late Weimar Germany is is taboo. That in itself is taboo. I could use the trigger words on that, but there you go. Kind of like the uh, ultimate we're censorship. Living, we're still living in that world that the abolitionists had to deal with, and I started calling myself a conspiracy abolitionist, not a conspiracy theorist which makes no sense. I call myself a conspiracy abolitionist. I think that's the clearest way to put it. Uh, I, I am, the, the idea of, I had this discussion with Joe on, on Twitter, anti-conspiracy, of course, who isn't anti-conspiracy? And you have the same problem with language when you talk about abortion, another trigger word. So we'll, you know, are you anti-abortion or are you pro-abortion? Nobody, I don't know anybody who's pro-abortion. I'm not pro-abortion. Uh, Everybody's anti-abortion. So it makes no sense. Those words make no sense. Anti-conspiracy, pro-conspiracy, they've been reversed. I don't think everybody's anti-abortion. I say, if you find a conspiracy, abolish it. It's that simple. I'm, a, I'm an abolitionist. I would say I think a lot of kids in my generation are probably pro it, especially if they're the ones having the kid. I think it means that nobody, uh, very few people would endorse the process of abortion. It's a very ugly 
thing to do. I think it's like talking about your pay. You should just be able to talk about it without feeling like you have to be stigmatized. I'm like, that's the only reason we learn. Yeah, no, it's it's necessary. It's all you know. You it, there are always going to be cases where abortion you have to have it, and it is ultimately the woman's right to choose. But the actual, you know, abortion is a nasty business. I think is is what he's getting at. Although there were people who were in favor of abortions, uh, they were in favor of other people getting abortions. They were eugenicists. Uh, one of them being Margaret Sanger. Um, which is, I know we're, we're getting, we're drifting off a little bit, but if anybody wants to look into that, that's a very interesting line of inquiry. But yeah, the psychology, the psychology of all this is important. And that's where my mind is a lot of the time, you know, I just kind of go, you know, with my daily curiosities and so, you know, eventually something builds and I'll read something, I'll put a couple of things together, I'll analyze what other people have written. And then the, my next essay just flows from that. I just let it flow. Um, Do you think it's getting worse when it oh, comes man. to having the conversation about topics like this? Because obviously there's self-censorship that starts to happen, whether it's on various platforms. But over the past five years, at least for the length I've been doing this show, I've noticed um, a, a giant shift and change in things that you can say and things that you can't say, things that are culturally taboo. Um, compared to things that are societal taboo. And I'm not talking about woke culture at all. I'm just talking about things that people will immediately not, mostly JFK stuff, but things that are deep, that are kind of government doing things with drugs from other countries, trafficking cocaine, whatever you want to say. These are topics that people shun you out of or will try and make sure that you do not have these discussions. And to me, they're conversations that you could be talking about, about like what flavored water do you like? They're not seriously, you know, to me, heavy topics, but there's a lot of people that don't want to address them. There's a lot of people that don't want to talk about things and it leads people into putting people in categories or not having a conversation at all. We should be able to talk freely about abortion. Your rights in, as an individual should not inflate or affect the relationship you have with someone just through conversation. Your political party shouldn't do that either. And also, if you do drugs or not, I'm not a drug advocate, even though everyone thinks I'm stoned 24-7. Um but there's a real thing about like even talking about earnings. I'm so I'll tell anybody really how much I get paid. You know, I, I don't know how I work two jobs and have to pay taxes at both fucking places. That's ridiculous. Um, but no, it's serious when it comes to having a conversation with people about things that we are somehow brainwashed and thinking are stigmatized when they're not really stigmatized. We just don't bother having the discussion to realize, oh, that's how you feel about that. OK, I don't feel like that, but whatever. I don't nothing's changed. The same the same process that we use to investigate um, different conspiracies, actual conspiracies, is qui bono, right? Is who benefits. So whenever you run into something like what you're talking about, um, who benefits from people not being able to talk about their salaries? The companies they work for, right? Good segue so there, Joe. That, that's, that's, you know, that's what we're talking about. It's, it's always who benefits in some fashion. And it's at the root of a lot of the censorship, you know, who's making the money from the things we're not allowed to talk about and so on and so forth. That's how it goes. That's the rabbit hole. It's the one that gets all these people thinking that either LBJ did it or whoever they thought did it when it comes to the Kennedy assassination. It was who profited. And honestly, if you took a dartboard and put a bunch of names on it, you could hit anybody and you would be able to hit at least one person because you can really look at who incentivized or who profited from Kennedy's murder. And that was a lot of people. The danger of using motive as evidence in a conspiracy. Conspiracy, by definition, means multiple motives. In a trial, in a conspiracy trial, motive is not a factor. It's means, you know, in, a, in an individual crime, means motive opportunity. You take out motive from a conspiracy trial because it's multiple motives. You know, you pick a guy, you'll find a, a different motive. Um, so focusing on motive in the conspiracy is something that the conspirators want us to do because it leads nowhere. Uh, you can have just about any motive you want, and, and people do. Oh, my God. You know, even, even on the subject of the JFK assassination, talking to other people who know this stuff, there are trigger words that, you know, I self-censor. You know, I don't want to talk about James Files. <laughs> um, 
I will talk about the – a lot of people don't want to talk about the Zapruder film being fake. I'll talk about that because I can, I can show that easily. I'll talk about the tramps. A lot of people get into big arguments about the tramps, who the tramps were. You know, let's uh, – <laughs> it's, it's all a game. We're playing this game. Let's resolve the Kennedy assassination. Let's make it official and accepted by the government. And let's get them to tell us what happened. Let's get them to show us the buried documents. And they know the whole story. They have the secret history. Get them to tell us. It's their job. It actually is their job to tell us what they already know. And they already know everything. And we just play this game. Uh, oh, the, oh, yes, I just saw this movie uh, for the first time. I haven't read the book, but I've known about it for years because of, because of my famous Texan series, Cynthia Ann Porter. Catherine, Catherine Ann Porter, uh, Ship of Fools. I don't know if you've seen the movie Ship of Fools. I just saw it yesterday, and what a what a movie that is! It really you'll see what we're talking about right now in the movie Ship of Fools, and certainly also in the book because it was um, Stanley Kramer and and Abby Mann. Abby Mann wrote. My two, my favorite team in movies, probably, who did Trial at Nuremberg together. Uh, Abby Mann wrote the script. Catherine Ann Porter wrote the book. Stanley Kramer directed. It doesn't get any better than that. And in that movie, all you do is you take what they're talking about. It's set in 1938, and it's a ship full of people who are traveling from Mexico to Germany. And it's a microcosm of the society of that time. Just pre-war, not well, well. The book was thirty-three. They set the movie in thirty-eight, but it's still pre-war. Nazis are on the rise. Springtime for Hitler, and it's all about if you take that subject and you turn it into the Kennedy assassination. It, it actually occurred to me I could write this book about a Kennedy assassination conference instead of a ship of fools. It would be a conference of fools. And you could write that story, but yeah, watch the movie and you'll you'll see uh, the conflicts that they have are the same conflicts we have and the ones we're talking about right now. The ta the taboos, the prejudices, it's all there in that movie. Yeah, pretty amazing. But oh yeah, you were you were you segue to the money. Yeah, the uh, who benefited the money. Um, we'll find we'll find that out too. We'll know that. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Off yeah. air. Okay. Damn. <laughs> too many okay, off air discussions. About, we there are still places where you can have uh, these taboo discussions uh, without the stigma. I was reading a thing yesterday. Somebody was lamenting that that uh, that um, Substack uh, Substack has a very liberal free speech policy. And somebody was complaining that there's all these Nazis, there's Nazi groups, neo-Nazi groups that have substacks and that are talking to each other. And, and But Substack came back and said, you know, you, you, can't, you can't censor anything. You've got to have free discussion. You have to have people free to tell the Nazis off and to, to, to say that they're lying. And... You know, uh, if we had had that in 1933, you know, things could have been different, but we didn't. Uh, but you always have to have totally free speech. Censor nothing uh, at no time ever. Nothing should be censored. Then we will get to the truth quickly. We'll get to the, uh, you know, we'll get, we'll get around that taboo quickly. And, you know, I fully admit that, you know, blood money, uh, academia, academia ignoring the subject uh, is not quite as direct as my dad working at the company that was putting the electronics on the Rex spy ship that was headed to Cuba. Uh, that's blood money. That's totally and that's and because Demoran Shield was trying to get Oswald a job at Collins Radio, that's blood money. That's right in the conspiracy itself. Kenneth Porter's there. Uh, it's, I admit that I benefited um, 
You know, I, I was, my daily meals came from that blood money, um, which is part of my motivation. I've never, I don't think I've ever said that to people who they ask you, how did you get into this and why do you stick to it? But a lot of it is, uh, you know, having to make up for that. And a lot of people are going to run into that once they, another reason they don't want to know the truth about this is because they'll find out that their neighbors were involved. Their family members were involved. They, there's guilt there, and you have to do something about it if you have a conscience. So we talk about, about the Hughes? money who benefited. We all benefited. You know, the Rolling Stones were right. They what used to disagree about with Howard Hughes? Howard Hughes? That's a big topic. something both of us didn't know, Joe. He said that Howard Hughes owned that theater that Oswald oh, was yeah. arrested at. Mm -hmm. How deep do you well, know didn't... about Howard Hughes? His name, he owned Spawn Ranch, or he worked, did some of his films on Spawn Ranch with the Manson mm -hmm. stuff. So that's very interesting mm -hmm. to me that that guy uh, apparently never cut his fingernails and drank a box, a bottle of. Uh... Well, that's a it's, that's a big topic, Howard Hughes, and how the CIA mostly he went took Boston over his on businesses. Me, he said topic. It, I'm sorry, <laughs> um, <laughs> but it is it's a it's a big topic. We should. Um, I mean, if you want to talk about that, that's probably a whole show, honestly. You can you can cut into it pretty directly when you talk about the Glomar Explorer. And it was operations like that that Hughes was totally involved in that made him love the movie Ice Station Zebra, which today, if you can see that movie, you will you will see the story. It's based on a real thing that happened in 1958. They had satellites that could read uh, license plates from orbit in 1958. This is only a couple years after Sputnik. Uh, they moved the movie up to 68, but still, nobody was saying you could read license plates from space in 68. And they say it in this movie, and that's why, that's why uh, Howard Hughes would call up his local TV station in Vegas and have them run that movie all the time because he wanted to see it. Uh, because it's a great spy movie. It is really a great spy movie about things that we're not supposed to know about that were just out there and in a movie in 1968. That's why he liked that movie. So it's like the fingernails, the hair, the, the reclusive, and watching Ice Station Zebra. But there's a reason for all that. And you've got to get, you don't just say, oh, what a nut. He was just like this nut. He had all this money, but he was a nut. Nah, he, there was a reason for all that. Uh, and that's where you start to learn about the, the world we're living in. You start asking yourself, why Why did he really do that? Why? I asked for years, why did he? Why was he so obsessed with Ice Station Zebra? Well, you watch it, you'll find out. Sounds like we're going to have a podcast Explorer. on Howard Hughes. Yeah. yeah, that's a really interesting. Actually, there's a very good article by Lisa Pease that gets into a lot of this stuff, which is, I think it's in the assassinations, the, um, the book that uh, Diogenio edited with Lisa. Um, it's a two part essay and it's, it's really interesting and it gets into some of this stuff. And the other direct route to all this is, is Robert Mayhew. Yeah. That's, that's where I'm going. Yeah. Yeah. Hughes's guy, Lisa in her book, uh, a lie too big to fail about the Robert Kennedy assassination. Puts it on Mayhew. Mayhew was the operational guy. Mayhew was the uh, Lansdale of the RFK assassination. I see Lansdale. I see that plot where you get the evidence, and the closer you get to the actual evidence, it splits into like three kinds of evidence. That's you look at you look at uh, Lansdale's style and and in creating a covert operation all the way back to his Philippines operations. That's the way he did it. He was he was a wild man when it came to audaciousness in covert operations, and the Kennedy assassination conspiracy. The more more you learn about it, the more you see that audaciousness. Um, and a lot, so, there were there were researchers who thought that Robert Mayhew was deep throat, and I don't I don't think they're right, but there's a reason why they thought he could be deep throat. Yeah, I definitely think it Bobby was more than Mark felt, but yeah, Bobby Ray and <laughs> I'll go on record. I'll still go on record. It was Bobby Ray Inman, and that's why they put, that's why Woodward and Bernstein put their papers at the Ransom Center at the University of Texas, where Bobby Ray Inman could keep an eye on them. 
and know who's looking at them. Same thing with Rostow and the LBJ Library. Rostow knew every researcher in the in the reading room. He was his office was down the hall from it, and you know he he saw every request every researcher made in the reading room of the LBJ Library, including mine. And I, I saw myself say, on and, and, and my pops. On a, and I, I had to go down the elevator eight floors with him one day, and not a word was spoken. It was like the scene in Three Days of the Condor with with the assassin. So it scared me to death, but it kept my cool. Well, bringing it kind of back full circle to the beginning, um, when it comes to, we talk about deep state, we talk about looking deeper, not having stigmatized topics. I mean, what are your thoughts on moving forward when it comes to just discussing events of the assassination, if you were to get people on board, or just talking about deep political topics in general? I always bring it up. My wife hates it. Uh, but I always bring it up at a party, wherever I am, conversation will eventually go around and I've, I've run into the most amazing people. Uh, a lot of people that will hear you say, oh, this this conspiracy, JFK assassination, they'll say, oh, you know, I had a neighbor from back then. And I, I ran into a lady that was a next door neighbor to George Wing in 63. And I asked her, uh, do you remember, everybody remembers a lot about that day. Uh, and he, he owned that station wagon at the time. I said, uh, do you remember anything about uh, your neighbor, George Wing, uh, that day? Uh, like, was he at home? You know, did you see his car? She said, you know what? He was away from home. His car wasn't there that day. He has a specific memory that he, he was gone from his house that day. The car was not there. So you I always bring it up, even though my wife hates me to bring it up. In, in public because of the taboo, you see. But you learn so much. You run into people who are, they don't even know they're part of the conspiracy, or they had this brush with the conspiracy. But And and there's no way anybody else would know it talking to them about it. But I know. I know, I know what to ask, and I know what to listen for. So, yeah, forget the taboo, man. You know, I'll keep talking about it. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel very much the same. The, um, you know, I, of course, I'm plugging away in whatever fashion I can uh, with my zines, trying to reach out to younger folks um, on Twitter, certainly, which although Twitter is really going down in flames, uh, but I get the most people asking me questions on Twitter, sending me messages on Twitter, uh, also on my website to some extent. So I try to, you know, answer people as honestly as I can and say, this is what I know, this is what I don't know. Uh, and this is good. This is a good way to work on finding out some of these answers. Um, and don't ignore stuff that was published, you know, in the fifties. Um, like for example, the invisible government that we started off this conversation with is still a good book. It's still really interesting. Um, you know, Vance Packard's the um, his books, the uh, the Hidden Persuaders. These are really interesting books that were published at the time that you can go back to and look and get yourself some kind of foundation so that you can understand future events. I, I had an essay in my first book that was called something like um, a, oh God, I can't remember what the hell I called it, but it was, it was, a, it was, a, the idea was to try to identify patterns and conspiratorial events so that you can then recognize them in the future and what to do and what to look for. You know, the early reporting that doesn't become part of the story is often very, very important. So the fact that they, 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 they said, oh, there was three people at this place, and later it turns out, no, there was only one. Well, that's the first place you chase down. They say, why did they say there was three? Was it a mistake or was it covered up? And you find that to be a useful tool in all of this stuff. And what John Judge said is that, you know, May Brussel would always say, what you do is you start from day one. So whatever the incident is, you start from day one and then you work backwards. And then you start looking for names and associations going backwards through time in the uh, historical record. So uh, those are all good tricks. Um, and I listed a few more, I think, at the end of my last book, Tinfoil Hat. So if anybody's interested in that. Do you guys um, want to promote your links, uh, Joe? We can start with you and then head over to Rich. Um, sorry to cut it short a little bit, but I'm a little bit limited yeah. on time. Yeah. 
Yeah, no, it's uh, Joe Green JFK. Um, I did join the Substack Brigade. Um, so I'm trying this thing. Uh, it's Paranoid Cinema. So I'm going to write more about movies on my Substack. And you can find Joe's Substack from my Substack, bartholoviews.substack.com. And uh, he's one of my recommended Substacks on my Substack. Uh, oh, I've got 35 years. That. Um, exactly a year. I just hit my one year anniversary in Substack. I got 35 essays up. I've dredged out everything that was behind a paywall or lost in the Mary Farrell Foundation files and the journals. And it's all out there except for one essay, which I will eventually get to. But I, I wrote a companion piece to a Jack White piece. And so I'll have to put. But it's the only thing I've ever written that didn't come out to be true. So I will I will do an editor's note where I say this didn't pan out, uh, you know, what we were speculating about, about uh, the and uh, it's the uh, what's the deal. Jack White's piece was called What's the Deal with 13 Inch Heads? He found a bunch of military photos where everybody had 13 inch heads, including Oswald and George Wing had a 13 inch head. So we were speculating about that. And I found an expert in those photos at one point who you know, completely showed how it could, could happen accidentally. So you still, today, you still have 13 inch heads, I've noticed. Substack, where the Nazis are. We'll, uh, we'll debate the Nazis on Substack. All right. Um, thanks for adding that to the cherry to the top of your Sunday. Um, thank <laughs> Thanks, everybody, for listening to this episode of Out of the Blank. Stay tuned for our next episode.